Uh, I'm really excited you guys are here because there's some really good talks going on right now. Uh, I know Jim and Preeti, and they're both like really, really good speakers, so you're probably missing out. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate that you're here. Um, I think it's going to be a good time. Uh, in general, I think this is going to be a little less technical than some of your other um, things you're going to today. Uh, there are going to be some tips and tricks that are like purely technical that I think will be very helpful. But in general, it's going to be more informative and uh, hopefully a little bit inspirational. Um, we'll see how that goes. Cool. So my name is Zach. This is my family. I can't really see very well because it's a little, a little far back there. But uh, this last Halloween, we dressed up as Gandalf. And that's my little son. And he was the cutest little hobbit in the world. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so uh, I work at Pinterest, a uh, software engineer on the web platform team. So we do a lot of things, but particularly we deal with uh, the uh, reusable UI library that we use within Pinterest, and uh, we deal with the, all the node infrastructure and most of the architectural decisions that we make uh, for the web. Uh, so currently, right now, I'm working on all of our uh, progressive web app strategies. So if you want to talk service workers, we'll chat service workers later. Uh, before Pinterest, I worked at PlayStation, uh, which is also here in San Francisco. Uh, it was really fun. I really liked working there. I was like one of the only married people there. And uh, it was mostly single dudes who like played video games all night. So I had a good time. When I started working for Pinterest, my wife got really excited and all of a sudden told everyone where I worked. <laughs> so I guess she was more excited about that. Um, like I said, I'm a husband and dad. Uh, I was raised in Seattle. Uh, but I'm here in San Francisco. We'll probably end up back in the Northwest someday. My wife's from Portland. Uh, so we're excited to get back there someday into a little bit more moderate weather, even more moderate than San Francisco. So, and a little bit cheaper. So that's also a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> Getting a hallelujah over there. All right, so uh, to get started, uh, I wanted to tell a quick little story. And this has to do with my very first big open source pull request. Uh, so I have, in the past, I had some like stuff up on GitHub. I had like a Angular Django REST framework seed project that had like 150 stars or something. But I had never really like contributed to a, like another big project before. And this was shortly after I started at Pinterest. So I've been there about two and a half years now. Um, this was shortly after I started there. Uh, and it, this is when AMP was starting, was just starting out. And we were very excited about that because we have... Well, first off, we've got like a bunch of widgets all over the web. Like if you've seen the pin-up button on pretty much any website, they've got our script running on their page, and we inject those pin-up buttons there. Uh, and so that would no longer work on an AMP page. So we were like, shoot, we, want, we need like some AMP Pinterest stuff happening. So uh, the guy who originally built all of our pin extensions, uh, his name is Kent Brewster. He was like one of the early employees at Pinterest, and he's still, he's still there going strong. Uh, he built the initial AMP stuff, and then I came through... And I was really excited because uh, this was something I was very passionate about. It was kind of right when ES6 was starting to get big. And uh, AMP supports all of that, just kind of out of, the, out, of, out of the bat. And so I converted a lot of our stuff over to ES6. I added another widget into the, into the library, and I did all of this in, like, one big request. And so I was, like, really excited. Uh, so if you're not familiar with AMP, it's Accelerated Mobile Pages. Uh, the idea is that you build these pages in a specific way, and Google will cache them on their own cache, so you don't even have to pay for like the hosting or anything, and they'll be super, super fast to load, um, and so we were excited about that. They've got about 10,000 stars on GitHub, 300 contributors, uh, so it's a pretty big project in general, and I was like super excited to start working on this. Uh, I like pulled my hat around, and I was ready to like chuck my GitHub Pokeball, uh, and then I submitted my request, and uh, I was the 1,119th PR to the project, so that was a little daunting, but also a little encouraging, because I was like, well, a whole bunch of other ones have been accepted, <laughs> so that's good. Uh, I changed 10 files, and I had 672 additions and 500, or 484 subtractions. So it was, a, it was a big PR, probably unnecessarily large. Um, I probably should have split it out into about four or five different PRs, but I was just so excited about it that I just like threw it all together and I just like kept hacking away and it was all working. So I was like super excited about it. And then I submitted it and 
there were 32 requested changes on my PR, <laughs> which didn't feel particularly good. Yeah. The hat went back forward, and I started crying. Uh, and essentially what happened was I had done all this work, but I really hadn't finished the autopsy of the AMP HTML project before I like, went and did all my work. Uh, so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about kind of digging into a big foreign library and how do you get started in understanding what's going on. Uh, so we'll talk about a couple different things. Uh, the overview is there's kind of th three basic parts to it. Uh, the first is an external examination, so going on like the autopsy theme, right? Uh, you're going to like look over the body, you're going to look over like the skin, see if there's like bruises and all that. I'm not going to get like really into this autopsy thing because I realize it would be very morbid. And there's no images either, so if you're, if you're a fan of The Walking Dead, you can keep watching that. You can get all the uh, descriptive nature you like. Um, second, like you take a blood sample. Like, there's a lot you can learn from uh, learning like how things run through the system. And the third is the Y incision, which in the autopsy terms is when they like do this stuff and open things. Yep, that's what we're stopped with that. Uh, so uh, moving on with it, uh, to start off is the external examination. And there's uh, quite a few things that go into it. Um, so what do you guys think? What is, what is the number one reason your PR will not be accepted? I want to like, see some hands out there. What do you guys think? No specs. No specs? Perfect. Yeah? Didn't follow the style. Didn't follow the style. Love it. Too big. Too big? Got me there. Yeah. Maybe it was unexpected. Unexpected, yeah. That's actually like really important one. Totally. Is there another hand out there? Um, because he has a wife and kids that does that thing with different PRs. Yes. <laughs> are you are you speaking to me? Did you? No, no, no. There was a recent uh, famous article about that. I'll say because I have an open source project that somebody just submitted something and then like like a week later I had responded and then like a week later they were like yeah it looks like Zach forgot about this thing and I was like <laughs> so I was like I hope that wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it wasn't, so we're good. All right. Uh, so somebody, someone nailed it. I can't remember who. I think it was over here. Um, code style, which seems like the stupidest thing, but if you don't like conform to the styles of the project, it's not going to get accepted. Which is kind of, which feels kind of dumb, right? Because like it, it works. I put my comma at the end instead of the beginning, and you're not going to accept it. Like what? That's so dumb. Um, but it is important for a, a big library to have. Um, conventions. Uh, so that's that's part of how this uh, external examination works. Uh, we want to look for conventions within the library. Uh, so there's a couple things in there. Uh, first is look at like the folder and file names, how things are named, where paths are, uh, where do tests and mocks live. If you're adding a new file, you want to make sure you're putting it in the right spot. There's a lot of times. There was just a PR this morning I was looking over for React where Sasha Aiken is adding a bunch of uh, server rendering tests. Um, which I think is really exciting because we use a lot of server rendering in React at Pinterest, and he didn't put he didn't name the file correctly, so they like had him rename the file, which like it seems so silly, but like conventions are really important. Um, so dependency management, you want to make sure like that's that's one of those things where it's a convention, but it's also really important when you're trying to understand a library. You want to be able to see like where things are coming from and where your things are going. Um, and looking at how things are imported and exported is kind of a, a big part of that. So if you're not familiar with like Common JS, AMD, and ES6, most most things have kind of moved over to uh, Common and ES6. Um, but be familiar with all of them; it'll help you a lot. Um, and then also, if they're using ES5 or ES6, if they're using ES6, they're probably going to compile down. Um, but be aware if they're not compiling down, you want to make sure you're not using like some new syntax that's actually not supported in the version of Babel that they're using. So um, that's the first part. Uh, that part's pretty easy. We just want to like kind of look around the library and see what things look like. Um, it's fairly simple. Just kind of getting an idea for conventions. Uh, the second is blood samples. So we want to kind of see how like how does this library work? Uh, if I pull down, if I like clone down the library and I want to like kind of start testing things out, like how does that work? Um, and that is, you want to jump into that package.json like immediately. You just go look in there. You can check out all the scripts. You want to see like. Like, are they running linters? If you are, if they are, then like that's going to help a lot when you're trying to pass their styles, like when you're submitting your PR. Uh, so you want to like run your linters locally before you even submit and have their CI yell at you. Uh, how do you run tests? Make sure you're like adding tests if you're adding code. Make sure you're running tests. Make sure you didn't break other tests. 
um, as well as like how do you actually get started when you want to like start adding something to the library. Um, so see how do you like get things going so you can see that what you did actually made a difference. Uh, so that's package.json right there. Uh, and the last one is that uh, Y incision. Um, oh, and as a side note, uh, there's this thing that I'm going to come back to, and I absolutely love this. If you're not familiar with it, we're going to talk about it, and it's actually like pretty cool. Um, so the last part is uh, the Y incision, and that's where we kind of dig into the guts. That's as far as that's going. Uh, so the first step is just clone it down. There's a lot of reasons. One of the main ones is GitHub search is absolutely the worst thing in the world. If you try to search for anything on GitHub, it's actually like so bad. Like the only things you can search for are like valid characters, like word characters. So if you add like this dot something, you will you will find nothing. Like it doesn't like the dot you can't even use in search, which is like the worst thing in the world. So yeah, you want to you want to clone down the library, um, especially while you're like trying to search things around. Um, secondly, like GitHub static page navigation is slow, but if you've got like your uh, editor open, things are going to be super fast, so it's going to save you time. Um, and then again, you want to be running your tests, your linters, your dev environment. So first thing you got to do, you got to clone it down. It's like not even a question. And then once you got it down, we're ready to go. So at this point, we're going to uh, do a little dive into a library. Um, so we're going we're gonna to dive into React. Uh, if you haven't looked at React source code before, uh, there's a lot of complicated things going on. Uh, it's getting more complicated with the new versions of React. Um, so we're going to take a look at it. So I'm going to actually pull up my editor and we'll see if we can not do that. It's over there. Okay, cool. Uh, let's zoom in here. Okay, it's not going to let me zoom in over there. That's annoying. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, I have to do this because we're, they're also like taking this, so I can't change from, I can't change to mirror, which would be really helpful right now. Um, and you can't even see what it's saying over there. That's okay. All right, so. What I want to do with you guys is we're going to learn about set state in React. Um, just as, as, as a note, like who here has worked with React before? So a good chunk of you. Cool. There's probably 90% of you. Um, for those who have not, uh, React is mostly a component library. So a component can have internal state to itself. And whenever you want to change the internal state, you call set state. And that'll kick off a new render. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We want to see like what is actually like going on with set state. There's there's some weird behavior to it that a lot of people don't notice, um, and so we're going to kind of talk about why that's going on. Uh, so to so to get started, I want to uh, kind of I'm going to take a look around in here, and maybe we'll have somebody in the front row. You want to like yell out what some of these things are in here? So I went into the source the source directory. Isomorphic is one of the folders. Renderers, shared, test, UMD, add-ons. That's not really particularly helpful when I'm looking for set state. <laughs> uh, is it in isomorphic? Is it in renders? It feels like renders maybe, right? Under renderers, what do we have? Native, DOM. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Art. Oh, where's Brian Vaughn? We got art renderer. Uh, DOM, that sounds kind of good. Under DOM, we've got stack, shared, yeah, fiber, I don't know. I don't know what set state's in. I have no idea. All right, so uh, one thing I like to do is maybe just like do a quick search for it. So down at the bottom, I'm going to search for set state. Uh, maybe we'll do like a colon first to see if we can find something that like... All right, so there's a couple things that have a function that has set state, but no, neither of those is the right one. Those say nq set state. Uh, how about set state equals? Hey, that looks good. That's set state. Nice. Okay. Well, that doesn't really tell me a whole lot about actually what it's doing, because it just called another function. All right, so I'm reasoning right now, like, there's going to be this big path that I have to take to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, so we're going 
we're going to do something that's going to make it a little bit easier to figure out. All right, so what we're going to do, sorry, those are my slides running. Let's make this bigger. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is there's that command that I had written up earlier, uh, the node debug dash break. Uh, that's a really interesting one. And what it does is it lets you inspect um, in the browser, like the actual path that something's taking. So if I come in here and let's, let's find a call to set state in a test, because then I can just run it and it'll be nice and easy. So I'm going to do dot set state and I'm going to search under source for something that has dash test.js. All right, so here's a test. React component with pure render mixin dash test, and it calls set state. So I'm going to stick a debugger statement right here because I want to know when I call set state, like what is it actually doing? All right, so then we come back over here. Um, I'm going to run the tests. This is like really hard without the mirror. All right, so this statement is, it looks kind of long and daunting, but it's not really. Uh, so essentially what it's doing is to run the tests in uh, React, you just have to type node or run like just, npm run just, or npm test. Um, but we can't do that when we want to use the statement, so we have to actually go into the node modules and use the just itself. Um, so that's, that's what it's doing. It's saying node, and then with this option, dash dash debug dash break, uh, go into node modules, get the just one, and then that dash dash run in band. So for just in particular, it like automatically splits out everything into different processes because uh, it wants to like make things faster. Um, but that doesn't work for debugging purposes. We want to run everything in a single thread. So that's what that means. And then I want to run that test that I found. So the test, I added a debugger statement into the test, and I want to, and I want to run it with that. Okay, so now it's saying there's something listening. And the second part is you have to run node-inspector. And this is something you should um, install globally. Um, and then that's all you have to do. So node-inspector, and then we're good. All right, so it gives me this link. I'm going to come up here, put that in. Cool, OK, so it's doing something in there. Oh, what is that? All right, I'm coming here. Yeah, it looks like it's, it's going. Yeah, OK, so it's, it's running. And what, essentially what it does is the very opening script, it's going to put a debugger statement like automatically. Um, and so if I push play, um, it'll take a little bit, but it will eventually uh, run the test. And once it finds the debugger statement, it's going to pause. Uh, so we can inspect anything we want at that point, and we can start like walking through functions, uh, which is really cool. Um, so it usually ends up taking like five to ten seconds, um, just because the way that it uses dash dash debug dash break, it like has to slow things down. Um, but it'll eventually get there, um, and at that point, we can start like walking through everything. Okay, cool. So let's pull this stuff kind of out of the way. And it found my debugger statement. Okay, so that's the debugger statement we put in there, and it's going to call set state. Uh, so what I want to do is, if you're not familiar with um, walking through code, you can like hover over these things in the top right and they say what it says. So this down arrow says step into next function. Uh, and that's what I want to do. So when I hit set state, I don't want to skip over it. I actually want to go see like the actual execution of it. Um, so it jumps into set state and we see React base class. That's the one that we found. Um, so it finds it automatically for you, which is cool. Um, I'm going to keep going. And so, and Q set state. So this is the one that we didn't continue on down the path. Um, so we're going we're gonna to dive in there and see what happens. Uh, dev. Don't really care about that stuff. Actually, let's skip out of that. So it's going to go grab an internal instance of the React component. And then looking down here, interesting. So what it does is it, it's actually kind of weird syntax to do it, but um, this underscore pending state queue, what it's doing is it's saying, hey, we've got this like new state update. Stick it in the pending state queue. And whenever you see Q, you think, oh, async, which is interesting because a lot of times we think with React set state that it's actually synchronous, um, but it's not actually guaranteed to be synchronous, which is a bug that a lot of people see. 
Um, so now you know why. Now you've seen it. It's uh, setting it into a queue, which may or may not be called immediately. Um, and there's reasons for that, and we can actually like look at that in a bit. So it goes in there, calls that stuff. Um, it actually does the same thing. You can pass in callbacks for once it's done. And so it queues up those callbacks as well. And then it calls and queue update, and it sticks the instance on there. Uh, so we can, if we, if we want, we can go down there and step into it. And all it's doing is it's just saying, OK, we've got this update thing that needs to happen for this React instance, which now has some things set. Right? It's got this like pending state queue, and it's got this uh, pending callback queue as well. And so it actually turns out that it does the exact same thing for like force update as well, if you've ever used uh, this dot force update. Um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so if we push play, we'll like end up running like all the things. If we come back in here, you'll see that like the tests all ran, they passed. Um, but it's a nice easy way to kind of dive in without actually having to like go through and search everything and like follow some weird path. You can just let things automatically do it for you. Um, I find myself very often going through when I'm trying to like dig into a new library and like step by step like going and finding a new file. Uh, particularly with Re React, it's actually like kind of hard. Um, so if we look up in base classes, that one that we had the set state in, these are the require statements. What the heck is that? Like the way that they require everything in the React code base does not tell you where that file lives, which is like kind of annoying. Um, so not having to like search for things and find out where things live is actually really, really helpful. Um, so that's what that no debug dash dash break thing does. Um, yeah, so if we, now that we've seen kind of where the set state queued up its action, we can say, okay, now I know that it's supposed to do something asynchronously, um, particularly I want to know, so I'm going to search for underscore pending state queue. And I don't want to do it inside the test. I just want to do it inside source period. All right, so let's see, like, oh, I typed it wrong. Underscore pending state queue. All right, cool. So now there's like all of these calls in here that are using the pending state queue. Like, I want to know what these things are. All right, so pending state queue. Process pending state queue. What is this function that we're in? Whoa, look at all those nice deep dev warnings. <laughs> React is really good for dev warnings if, you're, if you haven't used very much of it. <coughs> it's like, holy moly, like, where is this function even start? <laughs> Mount component. That's a really big function. But we found what we were looking for, which was uh, that pending state queue thing. Uh, and we found this process pending state which sounds also like it would be helpful. We go in there, and we pretty much see exactly what we would expect to see, which is coming down here. All right, we grabbed the state queue and the replace state, which is actually deprecated. And then we're going to go through and basically like merge all of the pending state changes together. Um, so this is particularly like one, one instance of why this happens in React uh, is in component will mount. Uh, so you can set your state in like a constructor and then have a component will mount. And you don't want to call a like immediate like render update inside component will mount because it's about to render. Um, so that's like one instance where like, oh, that's why it's async. I get it. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So yeah, do you guys have any like quick questions about any of that? Kind of walk through it really quick, yeah. yeah. So the reason why it's a PR uh, limit and uh, you can yeah. the, the other. Okay, so for those who didn't hear the question, um, making sure I understand this correctly, you're saying uh, when I'm submitting a PR to a company and or to a project and I need the changes immediately for my own work, um, kind of how do I deal with the waiting period before it gets merged and then submitted up to NPM, yep. right? Uh, the easiest way is to fork it. Yeah, you can just do like temporarily fork the project. For example, other people also have other PR and then you want those PR as well. And uh, your... Like other people out, like within your company? No, 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 not within your company. With, with the public, uh, people are PR something that's really good in the sure. software as well. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. And oh, interesting. How, how, how are you going to deal with uh, the... Yeah, I think at that point, like, forking is kind of the only way to go. Um, you kind of have to do the same thing that they're doing with set state and merge in all of their changes, yeah. right? Um, yeah, you can also, if, if their stuff gets changed or gets merged before yours, uh, you can, and yeah, I guess, I guess either way, like, you're going to have to fork it. But you can also set your dependencies to be a GitHub repo. So that's another option. But if you're waiting on your changes, yeah, you just need to fork it. Yeah, there's not really a great way to do that. Cool. Any other? Yeah. No, like when you're doing this kind of thing with the understanding of the whole architecture, Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've contributed to many things that I barely understand what's going on. <laughs> But I, I found some path that I understood, and that was the path that I needed to understand. Yeah, so like this, this, for this example, like maybe I want to make a change. Like actually, for, so an example, um, if we go back into, where was it? Uh, I think it might have been in here. So this was the process pending stage. If I go back to... Let me find something really quick. Uh, it was in a different file. Actually, like while I was doing this, I oh, I wrote it down. So there's this file that we found um, that gets called, and yeah. So in Q, oh, I want. And Q set state. Yeah, so we, we looked at this earlier, actually, and I forgot to mention, uh, if anyone's looking for their first bug to submit, check this out. This line does not need to, it's literally doing nothing. If you look at the line above it, if callback is something, then come in here. And then now you're saying, if callback is nothing, set it to null, otherwise set it to callback. I actually showed this to Brian Vaughn earlier, and he was like, yeah, that could probably get removed. <laughs> so if anyone like, wants to submit a quick PR, like, there you go. You can like, contribute to React, and then bam, you've got your first thing going for you. So yeah. Uh, I think there was other questions real quick. OK, then we'll, we'll keep going. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so coming up on the end here, um, my, that first PR that I did uh, with the AMP HTML project uh, actually ended up getting merged in like within seven days. Uh, even though there was 32 comments, uh, the people on the other end were very helpful. Um, I was very excited, so I, like, I was changing things as fast as I could. Um, so the fact is like, even though it like seemed scary, and even, so like I came in like really excited and then all of a sudden like my hopes were dashed. Um, but it really was not a bad experience. Like it came, it happened really, really quickly. Um, I'm going to come back to you really quick. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that I like, I wanted to touch on is that, like, we all feel this thing that that they call imposter syndrome, and we get we get really like freaked out by these big code bases, right? And, like React, like oh whoa, the React guys are so smart. Like come on, look at that code right there. <laughs> and it's like they're just humans. Um, and it's intimidating, but like the fact is like you can do it. Like there's really big, really big libraries out there. I remember uh, my first day at PlayStation, and the, the library there is like really weird. It's actually JavaScript running on the PlayStation console, uh, so they have like their own like version of JS Core and like their own like rendering library that they called Trilithium XML, <laughs> which was very daunting when they like started telling me about it. I was like, what the? Um, so like my first day was actually like at this company-wide conference down in San Diego where they get together to like, like plan everything out. And someone assigned a bug to me because I had no idea. Like I couldn't help plan anything because I, was, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, so they gave me a bug, and I like kind of applied some of this stuff that I just talked about, and I like fixed the bug within like an hour. And they were like, what the? Like how did you do that so fast? But like it was like a text change or something. Like it was really dumb. Um, so like even though like there's times where we feel this imposter syndrome, like remind yourselves of times like that where you've like been able to do something really quickly. Because we all have them. Like we have these moments, like where we totally shine, and these other moments where we just like 
suck bad. And don't dwell on those, especially when you're like trying to like get involved in like open source and stuff like this. Like don't think about those times where like things didn't go well. Think about those times where like you can remind yourself, oh yeah, actually I'm actually pretty good at this. Like I'm actually like not a bad developer. Even though like my wife probably thinks that I'm terrible because she's she's actually a coder as well. Um yeah, uh another another note when you're trying to get into something like this. Um I don't know how like it's a quick quick reference like how many of you have actually like contributed to a big open source project before? Okay, so like a, a few of you. Uh maybe like a quarter. Uh for those who haven't, find an advocate, find a mentor or somebody. Uh so an example, um I'm currently mentoring uh this girl named Michelle at Pinterest and she also had never contributed to anything on like any big projects before, and we found a bug in ESLint that had to do with like some of the new syntax of JavaScript, where you can like destructure things and use like a REST parameter like inside your destructuring to grab the rest of the properties. Um, and people are using that to omit properties from an object, um, but then the things that were omitted were being counted as no unused variables because they're not being used elsewhere. And we're like, well, they're actually being used because their presence like affects the rest of the stuff. Um, so I was like, okay, Michelle, let's submit a PR to ESLint. Let's do this. Um, so if you haven't done it before, like find somebody who has and say, hey, like next time you find something like you want to contribute, like let me know and let's get involved. Like I grabbed her and we like sat down for an hour and in an hour we had like submitted a PR to ESLint that like updated like their AST parsing stuff that allowed it to happen. Like, it, it really wasn't that bad. Um, so don't worry about imposter syndrome. We all suck, and we're all awesome. Find a mentor. Like, those are really, really important things. Um, that's the end of my rant, and that's also the end of the presentation. Uh, there was a the quick comment or a question back here, so we'll, we'll start up over there. Oh, the changes? Uh, we could... I wonder if we could, uh, we won't look. Okay. Um, <laughs> so some of them were style things. Uh, some of them were, there was like APIs that I wasn't aware of that they had, like that made things a lot easier. So like I had re-implemented some things that like didn't need to happen. So like I would like rip out maybe 50 lines of code that I didn't need because they had something to do it easily with. Um, uh, there was a few like doc changes that like I didn't like write the docs the way that they write the docs. So. Most of them are like pretty small, um, and then things like that I didn't know about because I didn't really look into it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Let's say you found a bug, but it's easy to solve right now. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So how do you handle? Do you fork it and then use your fork as your repository for dependencies, or because that's not really necessary? Yeah. Yeah. What What we do usually at Pinterest is, if so the first thing we'll do is we'll go submit a PR to the project, um, and we'll kind of get a feel for how fast it's going to go. So like we've got a Webpack plugin that we have forked that we've had forked for about three months, because it's just not <laughs> like they're not really dealing with it. Um, so yeah, fork it if they if they're going to go slow. If they're going to go fast, then just like maybe like wait a day. Some people are like really awesome and they'll like accept your PR. Like I remember I submitted a bug fix to Jest when they like first bumped to like 16.0 and like literally within an hour it was submitted and he had already like published a new version for me. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so some people are fast, but. So if you fork it and use the dependency, if there's a new version and your PR didn't go through, you would like handle the whole? Yeah, so that's, that's definitely the problem, right? Like yeah. you, um, yeah, fork it and then kind of see if they don't accept your PR, then you can revert your fork because it's, there's probably a reason why they didn't accept it, so. Great question. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thank you. Oh, last question. Cool. Yeah, sorry. No, you're good. Have you ever, um, this is more of an example, but or have you ever seen a library that did, uh, like, you, you, this one was nice because it had, like, a node base test that you were able to kind of jump into and debug to call it something? Have you ever tried to contribute to a project where it's, like, they're using some weird dev setup or framework or doing a Selenium test for this to work? Not really. I mean, unless you have like a better way to do it, 
that could be another PR you submit. And be like, hey, your way is, your way is terrible to do testing. Uh, so like right now I'm working on a lot of service worker stuff and there's like no way to test service workers because they're in their own environment. Like they have all these like special globals and stuff. Uh, so I just built a library that creates a service worker environment and I'll probably open source that in the next couple of weeks. So, so it's like one of those things like if there's a good way to do it, do it. If their way is like not good and you have a better way, like help them change it. Um, if there's not a way, make a way. Oh, so there, there should be ways for that to work. I think they're probably doing that as well. So like for the React library, uh, Jest is running uh, Babel Jest because uh, they use like classes and stuff. Um, so it should be able to map back to the original files. Yeah, Chrome is pretty smart. That's a good question though. Okay, cool. Thank you guys for coming. Um, as a side note, uh, my name is Zach Argyle. You can find me as Zach Argyle on pretty much everything. GitHub, Twitter, Medium, all of the above. Z-A-C-K, Argyle. Um, yeah, I will be tweeting out the link to the presentation. So if you have like questions, you can feel free to ping me there. Um, yeah, nice to meet you guys. Come say hey.